So, what's going on here then? No, it's not a magic show, no magic tricks. What I have are four cones. They're all the same cone, okay? But they've been split in rather different ways. Let me just show you how they've been split. Let's take this one first of all, the red cone. If you just have a horizontal plane of symmetry and just cut the top off, what happens? You get this shape. What shape is that? That's a circular shape, and that's one of the conic sections, all right? Now, let's see what other shapes we've got. I'm just going to put that one down by there. This next one, the green one, this has been cut in a slightly different way. If you don't have a horizontal cut, but more of a diagonal cut, like this, what happens? What shape do you get? Can you see? That is forming the shape of an ellipse, all right? Not a circle, that one's an ellipse. And I'll put that one just by there. And then this one, I'm going to cut it at a steeper angle such that the cutting is going to also um, go through the base as well, such that it's cut like this, okay? Now that has been cut in a particular way. If I move my fingers, can you see? Can you see the cutting has been moved such that this cutting is parallel to this. It's not really a side, is it? Because it's actually a cone, it's curved. But it's parallel to this side if you look at it head on. It looks like a side, doesn't it? It's more of a sloping surface, all right? So the cutting is actually parallel to the sloping surface. And what shape do we get? we get what's called a parabola. Okay, let me just put that one down by there. And then finally, what happens when we have more of a vertical cut? It doesn't have to be vertical, but it looks more of a vertical cut, this one. And we get this shape. That's called a hyperbola. Let me just show you them one at a time. Okay, so this one's the circle, and this one here is the ellipse. You can see the ellipse is like an elongated circle. Okay, both cuttings were made such that the cutting does not go through the base at all. These ones, the cuttings did go through the base. I'm just going to turn them upside down, okay? Because you're probably more used to seeing a parabola looking like this, aren't you, okay? However, you can have them like this or like this. Basically, it's the same shape, isn't it? On the graph, you'll find it looks like this, okay? And the same with this one. These cuttings were made using um, the base, as in the, um, the cutting went straight through the base, okay? Remember this one, the cutting was such that the cut was at uh, an angle that's parallel to the slope inside, and it made this parabola. Now, the hyperbola looks like it's a parabola, but you can see actual that the, uh, the curve is, is slightly different, okay? Let's have a look to see what they look like from here. You can't see, see them as well, can you? Okay, but that's what the cutting actually makes in terms of the cone. If I try and fit them together, obviously it does not go, okay? In terms of this, obviously it does not look the same, does it? Okay. I just want to illustrate to you, before I continue my presentation, um, where the conic sections actually come from and how we can just take different angle slices to get our different shapes. Okay, I'm hoping you found that interesting. Well, I hope you enjoyed the models I just showed you now involving the cuttings and how the conic sections are formed. Let me just show you this lovely diagram there, okay, because it further illustrates what's going on. And let me also show you again each of these one at a time. So that one there, for example, when the cutting was made of the horizontal plane, that is the circle. You can see that one there, nicely matched to my colour. I did not do that on purpose, by the way, that's just a mere coincidence, which is quite nice. And that is the circle, as you can see. Uh, next one was this cutting here, where the angle was... Um, not horizontal, okay, but not quite um, so that it makes a uh, cutting with the base. And that one there, you can see, is the ellipse. All right, again, nicely matched there. Let me just show you the elliptical shape on the top. All right, isn't that lovely? And then this one there, the special one where the cutting was such that the angle of the cutting was parallel to the angle of the sloping face, um, sloping side, shall I say. Um, you can see that one there, the parabola. If I just turn it on its side, so you can see head on, in other words, you can see the parabolic shape that it's making. And then the last one, where the cutting was a bit more vertical, doesn't have to be vertical there, um, but it's not parallel to the slope inside anymore, the sloping edge. And that's the hyperbola, this one there. Okay, if I just show you head on, you can see what it actually looks like. Okay. First up then, the parabola. The parabola. We love a parabola, don't we? Okay, we should do because it came up fairly early on in your mathematical career. GCC mathematics, possibly before, when you're dealing with quadratics, because if you were to draw a quadratic or you were to illustrate the quadratic roots on a graph, you'd be drawing a parabola. Although probably at GCC level, it was either a U-shaped parabola or an N-shaped parabola, wasn't it? Okay. Well, here's the conic section that I cut off. There we go. 
And it doesn't really matter what orientation I give it to, that was the blue cutting that was made from the actual cone, there we are. Um, we just generally draw the parabola this orientation. That's all, okay? And we use the more common equation, y squared equals 4ax, at this level in mathematics, okay? This is what's called the Cartesian equation, named after, of course, the great René Descartes. Okay, Cartesian comes from Descartes, of course. What a fantastic mathematician. Okay, but I'm not here to talk about him. That is our Cartesian equation. You ought to have heard of parametric equations by now, of course, and the parametric equations are these. X equals 80 squared and Y is equal to 280. Let's just take a moment to remind ourselves about how this is actually working. You, of course, should remember, if you've seen parametric equations, how to convert them from parametric to Cartesian. And the method is, if you just look at the y, equation for y, and you rearrange it, you make t the subject, you're going to get t is equal to um, y over 2a. Okay, y over 2a. Then you substitute it into the other one, substitute into the equation for x, and you get x is equal to a t squared. So you're going to get a multiplied by this, which is y squared over 4 a squared. I'm sure you can see, quite simply, this does simplify to that. Okay? Just put the 4 over to that side, um, and you've got uh, an a on the new denominator. Bring that over as well, and y squared equals 4 ax. Right. Let me just reset the board for you to get rid of that. Um, next up, uh, what else can I talk about? This lovely problem. Um, the focus point and the dielectrix. Okay, the focus point and the dielectrics. The focus point is A0, and yes, that is the same A that appears in the parametric form and the Cartesian form of the equation. So that's pretty hand, isn't it? Pretty good. If you know what the equation is, you can write down the coordinates of point A is. And the directrix is a vertical line such that it passes through x equals negative a. So the equation is x equals negative a. Now, how is the parabola defined? Well, it's done using locus, locus of points. That lovely subject that you also probably did at GCC. Only we don't get our ruler and compass out at this particular level. We just talk about it instead. But you need to know what I mean by a locus of a set of points if you're going to get anywhere in this particular unit. Now, how a parabola is defined is like this. You take any point P, there it is, on the parabola, okay? Any point P, and the distance between P and the focus point, PS, is exactly the same as the distance between P and this point M on the dielectrix. There's another point there, Q, did exactly the same thing. Q to S, okay, is the same as Q to, well, let's just call it M dash, if there's another one, all right? That is sometimes called the focus dielectrics property, in that this um, distance here between PS and PM is always going to be exactly the same. But this parabola is defined such that all of these points along the curve satisfy that given rule. And then on to something else, okay? The eccentricity. The eccentricity. E, okay? No, not Euler. E, 2.71, etc. Um, not the other one in mechanics either. Um, I'll remember what that is in a minute. Coefficient of restitution. Oh, I almost had a blank there. No, not that one. This is yet another E that you have to contend with in mathematics. Okay? And it's defined by this ratio, PS over PM. All right? So P to S over P to M. Okay? Because on the other curves you're going to see, this ratio is going to give us a slightly different value. Now, because these distances are the same, you can see the ratio PS over PM is 1. So we say the eccentricity on this curve is 1. Okay? And that's pretty much a broad outline of what you need to know about the parabola before you get started on those lovely challenging questions, of course. The ellipse. The ellipse, okay? Not quite as cool as the parabola, but it's fairly cool. I mean, it looks like a TIE fighter, for goodness sake. I mean, that, that is, that's got to give it some cool status, all right? And also, I do like astronomy, and you should be aware that the Earth orbits the Sun in an elliptical path, so it's got some cool um, astronomical um, implications as well. This is what the conic section looked like when I showed you the cuttings and the ellipse, and it's going to go you through some properties of this lovely-looking curve, okay? First of all, the Cartesian equation, as such, x squared over a squared plus y squared over b squared equals 1. And the parametric equations, x equals a cos t, y equals b sine t. Let's just take a moment to think about how the parametric equations can be formed or used 
to get the Cartesian equation. Let me just show you. If I write cosine t as a subject, I get x over a. And then if I write sine t as a subject, I get y over b. And then if I square each of them, like this, that is cosine squared t, that is sine squared t. If I add them together, cosine squared t plus sine squared t equals 1. That's the trigonometric identity that you must have learned at some stage. Okay? So doing that conversion is actually quite straightforward, isn't it? Um, other things about the ellipse, how is it defined? How is it defined? What's the locus of the points this time? Well, actually, you'll see that there's two focus points there. And we define it such that the distance between any point in the ellipse and the first focus point and that same point and the second focus point, the sum of those two distances is always constant. Okay? So that is PS plus PS dash, that's labelled as, the sum of that is always constant. It's actually equal to 2A. Okay? So that's how an ellipse is defined. Now, with each focus point comes a directrix. Okay? So with this focus point, you've got this directrix. The equation x equals a over e. And notice because of the symmetry, with the y-axis being the line of symmetry, um, this directrix has got the equation x equals negative a over e as well. Okay? And the focus point itself, a e0, negative a e0. And yes, the a is the same a in the equations, both forms Cartesian and parametric. And the e, yes, that is exactly the same as the value of the eccentricity. Now, the eccentricity is always defined to be the same. That is that ps over pm is how we define the eccentricity. You remember in the parabola? Well, in the parabola, these two distances in red were the same, weren't they? And hopefully on the diagram it's quite clear that they're not the same. In fact, pm is greater than ps. That's always going to be the case. And because of that, this ratio, ps over pm, is going to be such that the eccentricity lies between 0 and 1. Okay? That's pretty much what you need to know about the ellipse. So the hyperbola is next and this was the cutting that was made, okay? This was actually what it looked like. Let me just show you again, all right? So that was the hyperbola and here it is, okay? There's lots going on here in the hyperbola, isn't it? There's lots going on in the hyperbola. So where should we start? The Cartesian equation, of course. It is this, the same as the ellipse, except it's not plus, it's subtract. X squared over A squared subtract Y squared over B squared equals one. So it's fairly simple to remember. Now, the parametric equations, there's two different ways you can define it parametrically. You've got x equals a sec theta, y equals b tan theta, or alternatively, you've got x equals a cosh theta, y equals b shine theta, okay? It should be quite obvious to you, I hope, that you can define the parametric equations using hyperbolic functions. Hyperbolic functions, the hyperbola, yes, I think you've just got it. Okay, we can also define them using trigonometric equations. Let me just illustrate to you how that actually works. Okay, for the trigonometric equations, I'm just going to show you a simple identity. Um, remember, sine squared theta plus cosine squared theta uh, is equal to one. I'm hoping you can see that. Okay, divide both sides by cosine squared, you get tan squared theta plus one equals sec squared theta. Now, what have we got? We got sec theta is x over a. Okay, so sec squared theta must be x squared over a squared, okay, and y equals b tan theta, so tan theta must be y over b, so y squared over b squared there. So can you see if I just rearrange it, I've got y squared over b squared, okay, if I just put that onto that side, I'll have x squared over a squared minus y squared over b squared, is equal to 1. Okay, so just keeping the 1 there, putting that to that side, right, left to right. I'm hoping you can see that. Um, okay, so that's how you get from the trigonometric form of the parametric equations to the Cartesian equation. Let's just turn the board over. Okay, what about the, the, um, the hyperbolic parametric equations? Well, here you may have seen, well, I'm hoping you have if you've seen hyperbolic functions, this identity, cos squared theta, subtract shine squared theta equals 1, okay, and then you've got cos theta is x over a, so x squared over a squared, subtract, and shine theta is y over b, y squared over b squared 
equals one. Even easier, isn't it? Personally, I find hyperbolic functions easier than trigonometric functions. It's just things like that that you know, just, just demonstrate how much easier it actually is. And that explains how we get from this parametric form to the Cartesian form. Okay. What else about the hyperbola? Okay. Um, let's just get rid of this. That'll come up later on. Um, shouldn't have been there, to be honest, but that'll come up later on. Um, two focus points, yet again. And you've got uh, two directrices, okay, yet again. Um, this time, uh, how it's defined is that the distance between point P and S and the distance between point P and the other focus point there, the difference between these is always constant. Remember with the ellipse, it was the sum of those two were always constant. With the hyperbola, it's the difference between P and S and P and S dash. They're always going to be um, constant, okay. Now... Let's just finally talk about the, um, the eccentricity, also defined as PS over PM. This time the eccentricity is greater than 1, because well, it's not really that clear from the diagram, okay? Uh, maybe if I choose different points, but you've got the distance P to S and the distance P to M. It's always the case that P to M is going to be greater than P to S. Maybe it's clearer as you get further up on the, uh, on the actual curve of the hyperbola, okay? But the eccentricity is always greater than 1. Okay, um, just a couple of other cool things about the um, hyperbola. Where am I? There. Okay, um, just talk about the asymptotes. I didn't put the asymptotes on the previous diagram because it gets rather cluttered, okay? But they do have asymptotes. The hyperbola is actually asymptotic. That is, the actual curve of the hyperbola tends towards... Um, either one of these diagonal lines, okay? The equations of the asymptotes, y equals negative b over ax, and y equals positive b over ax. That's quite quick and easy to explain. What we're looking at with the asymptotes is what happens to x and y as they both tend towards infinity. So as x tends towards infinity, and y tends towards infinity, what is happening, okay? Well, let's look at the equation, all right? As they tend towards infinity, you've effectively got x squared over a squared is equal to y squared over b squared. Because at infinity, the number one is neither here nor there. Thank you, school bell. Great. Yes, I'm still in school. Okay. Um, yes, the, the one is neither here nor there when we're talking about infinity. Okay. So you've got this subtract this equals zero. So put this onto that side, hence you can see. Then square root both sides. Okay. Um, I'll tell you what. What I'm going to do is I'm going to write like this. I'm going to put the positive negative on the left. So you've got x over a. And of course, you only need to do the positive negative on one side when you're square rooting. And you've got y over b on the right hand side. And then bring the b over to this side. You've got y equals positive or negative b over ax. Hence this there and that there. Okay? And that is most of what you need to know about the hyperbola. Okay? I hope you liked my introduction to conic sections, okay, it's probably a rather lengthy video. Um, I'm hoping you found it useful and maybe you'll tune into some of my worked examples involving the conic sections. Comes with a word of warning, they are quite challenging, okay, they are quite challenging, but fun, okay. Where's the fun in maths if there's no challenge, okay. Right, thank you, have a good day, I'll see you again.